At 2.47 p.m. Japan Standard Time today, a magnitude 7.6 earthquake struck beneath the seafloor 30 miles east of Hokkaido's northernmost main island, Hokkaido, close to the coast of Aomori Prefecture. Within minutes, the Japan Meteorological Agency triggered a major tsunami alert for waves that could reach 3 meters. What followed was a tense four-hour watch along hundreds of kilometers of coastline. This is the latest in a string of unusually powerful quakes that have rattled the Pacific Ring of Fire in the past 18 months. And it raises an uncomfortable question many seismologists are now asking in public. Are mega thrust events of magnitude 7.5 and above quietly shifting from rare to recurring? And if so, why? The hypocenter was located approximately 50 kilometers beneath the sea surface along the complex boundary where the Pacific Plate subducts beneath the Okhotsk Plate at roughly 8 centimeters per year, one of the fastest convergence rates on Earth. Initial automatic mechanisms reported magnitude at 7.2. After manual review, the JMA upgraded it to 7.6, with the US Geological Survey settling on 7.5. Even a 0.4 difference represents nearly double the energy release. Peak ground acceleration exceeded 800 gals in parts of the eastern Iwata coast, strong enough to throw people to the ground and buckle unreinforced masonry. Shindo 6 Loa was recorded in seven towns, meaning most unsecured furniture moved violently and some windows shattered. Remarkably, because the rupture occurred offshore and the strongest shaking was directed away from major population centers, structural collapse reports remain limited at zero as of 11 p.m. Tokyo time. Japan experiences roughly 20% of the world's magnitude 6 and above earthquakes, despite occupying only 0.3% of Earth's land area. Since 2004, the country has endured four events of magnitude 8.0 or greater, including the catastrophic 2011 Tohoku earthquake. That statistical concentration is not random. It is the direct consequence of sitting on four converging tectonic plates. Within six minutes of the rupture, the Japan Meteorological Agency issued a major tsunami warning for the Pacific coast from eastern Hokkaido down to central Iwate forecasting possible waves up to three meters. Sirens sounded, mobile phone emergency alerts blared, and more than 210,000 residents in low-lying districts were urged to evacuate immediately to higher ground or designated vertical shelters. By 4.10 p.m., a tsunami 35 centimeters high was observed at the offshore GPS buoy 15 kilometers east of Kuji Port, Iwate. 25 minutes later, a 48-centimeter wave arrived at Erimo Town on the Hidaka coast of Hokkaido, followed by a 45-centimeter surge at Urakawa. The highest recorded wave on the mainland reached 1.1 meters at Miyako, Iwate, far below the feared 3-meter scenario, but still sufficient to overtop some seawalls and flood fishing ports. At 5.42 p.m., after confirming that later waves were diminishing, authorities downgraded the warning to an advisory, allowing residents to return home under caution for possible aftershock-generated waves. The entire operation was textbook. Evacuation completion rates exceeded 94% in most municipalities, a drastic improvement from 2011 when many hesitated. Three nuclear stations lie within 200 kilometers of today's epicenter the Higashidori plant in Aomori, the Onagawa plant in Miyagi, which survived 2011 with minor damage, and the troubled Fukushima Daini and Daiichi complexes farther south, all automatically scrammed within seconds of detecting strong motion. By early evening, plant operators reported no abnormalities in radiation levels, coolant systems, or containment integrity. The International Atomic Energy Agency confirmed the assessment shortly after midnight Japan time. Nevertheless, the event served as a fresh reminder of 2011. That magnitude 9.0 quake generated acceleration far beyond design basis at Fukushima Daiichi, disabling backup diesel generators when tsunami waters flooded underground switch rooms. The ensuing triple meltdown released roughly 10% of the radioactivity emitted at Chernobyl and forced the permanent evacuation of 160,000 people. 
Today, more than 950,000 tons of treated but still mildly radioactive water continue to be released in controlled batches into the Pacific under IAEA supervision, a process begun in August 2023 and projected to continue until at least the 2050s. Meanwhile, retrieval of the estimated 880 tons of melted fuel debris from reactors 1, 2, and 3 remains in early robotic probing stage with full removal perhaps decades, if not a century, away. Here is the data point that seismologists find difficult to dismiss. Between 1900 and 2003, the global average was 0.8 earthquakes of magnitude 8.0 or greater per decade. From 2004 to 2014, the decade that included the Sumatra, Chile and Tohoku events, the planet recorded 1.8 per year, more than double the long-term rate. Since 2015, the rate has remained elevated. 14 events of M8.0 plus in the past 10 years alone, compared to 15 in the entire 20th century before 2004. Magnitude 7.5 to 7.9 events show a similar uptick. The 20th century average was roughly 4 per year. Since 2010, the average has been closer to 7, with 2021 to 2025 already recording 38 such events, on pace for the highest 5-year total since modern recording began. Seismologists are careful to state that plate tectonics has not suddenly accelerated. The plates still move at centimeters per year, as they always have. So what could be changing? Several peer-reviewed hypotheses have emerged. Post-glacial rebound and stress redistribution, the melting of continental ice sheets since the late 19th century has reduced vertical load on some continental margins, allowing faults to relax and occasionally slip in great earthquakes. A 2023 study in Nature Geoscience calculated that Greenland and Antarctic ice loss could advance the timing of certain megathrust events by decades to centuries. Groundwater extraction and induced stress changes. Humans have pumped trillions of tons of groundwater since 1900, particularly in subsiding deltas along subduction zones. Jakarta, Tokyo, Osaka, Dhaka. Removing that water mass alters crustal stress by tiny amounts, but in critically loaded faults, tiny can be enough. A 2024 paper in Geophysical Research Letters found measurable correlation between groundwater depletion hotspots and increased shallow seismicity. Ocean bottom warming and hydrate dissociation. The upper 1,000 meters of the world ocean has absorbed more than 90% of excess heat from greenhouse warming. Warmer bottom water can destabilize methane hydrate deposits along continental slopes, reducing friction on some models suggest by up to 15% on certain fault planes. While no single quake has been definitively linked, the Cascadia and Nankai subduction zones both show hydrate layers within the temperature window now being crossed. Statistical clustering versus true rate change. Some researchers argue we are simply living through a natural clustering similar to the 1950 to 1965 burst that included the 1960 Chile M 9.5 and 1964 Alaska M 9.2 Distinguishing between century scale clustering and a genuine anthropogenic trigger remains the central debate in seismology today What is not in debate is preparedness fatigue Japan has spent more than 12 trillion yen approximately 80 billion US dollars on tsunami walls, seismic retrofitting and early warning systems since 2011. Yet each new event tests the limits of even that investment. Today's quake produced shaking 40% stronger than the design basis for many 1970s era seawalls along the Sanriku coast, prompting immediate calls for another round of expensive upgrades. As of this broadcast, aftershocks continue every few minutes, including a magnitude 6.1 event at 9.14 p.m. local time. No fatalities have been reported and major infrastructure remains intact, a testament to decades of engineering and public education that no other nation matches. 
Yet, the larger story may be unfolding on a time scale measured in centuries rather than hours. If the elevated rate of great earthquakes persists through the 2030s and 2040s, the insurance industry, coastal cities and nuclear regulators will face risk models that no longer match reality. For now, the people of northern Japan are cleaning mud from their streets, checking on elderly neighbors and going to bed knowing the earth beneath them is still restless. Whether today's tremor was simply the ring of fire doing what it has always done or a symptom of a planet we have pushed out of equilibrium, only the next few decades of data will tell.